Open your Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2. Our preaching text this morning will be just on verse 13, but I'll begin reading from, chapter, from verse 9 and go to verse 16 for the reading. And here we're going to find the Apostle Paul ending his defense of his ministry. Up to this point, he's been defending it against unknown detractors, though we can tell what they had said by the things that he defends himself against. But now he turns to the Thessalonians' real need. And their real need is to be strengthened in their resolve to stay true to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at this verse and see what he gives them as he begins to tell them what they need to strengthen, how they are strengthened as they await Christ as they live a life worthy of the calling by which they have been called, which was the subject of last week's message by Pastor Conley. We're going to see here verse 13. And I just want to tell you before we read the whole section that verse 13 sort of looks two ways. It looks up to what just occurred and why that occurred. It's because of the power of God's word. It's because of God's word having gone forth. And it looks down to what follows. How do they find the strength to persevere in what is going to come in the persecutions that are sure to be headed their way? As they and as we await for Christ to return, they and we must keep ourselves under the influence of the word of God and not the word of men. And so with that short introduction, and we'll get to the preaching in a moment, please stand for the reading of God's word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and beginning at verse 9 for you remember brothers our labor and toil we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God you are witnesses and God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers for you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Verse 13, our text this morning. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. Please be seated. May God bless the reading and now the proclamation and the hearing of his word. Let's go to him in prayer as we anticipate that. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come before you once again. We pray, Lord, that preacher and hearer alike have prepared themselves for the proclamation, for the hearing of your word, that it might have the effect upon us which you, Father, intend by the word that you have given us. We understand this word to be the very word of God. We submit ourselves to you in the hearing of it, and pray that you would have your way with us, that it would be applied to our lives in the way that you intended. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I was a teenager, way back in the 70s, there were a lot of things happening. A lot of different movements and a lot of different um, things that would, were attracting people. Crazes, we could call them. And one of them when I was in my mid-teens, was a book by an anthropologist named Carlos Castaneda. And his book was called The Teachings of Don Juan, A Yaki Way of Knowledge. It was all the rage. Now Castaneda interviewed this Yaki Indian shaman named Don Juan. And Don Juan told him how by ingesting certain psychedelic compounds and going into certain kinds of meditation, you could have this out-of-body experience that they called astral 
projection. I don't know if that word's still in vogue, but that's what they called it then. It was very influential. I had a lot of friends who were good students with decent grades, and they were intelligent folks, and I've got a hand being raised, and you need to repent, and we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, it was all the rage for a long time, and a lot of my friends got into this, and I lost some friends over it. They were so much influenced by it. Uh, I don't know if any of them ever had an actual out-of-body experience. I'm pretty sure not. I never tried it, okay? I didn't try it, so I speak from common sense, not experience. But that book was very influential. Intelligent people were taking it in and saying, oh my goodness, if I do this and I think this way and meditate like that, I can astrally project and have this out-of-body experience. I don't know what they intended to do with it. Um, from what I could see, all, they did, all that happened, all that was accomplished, and they became walking morons saying things like, far out, man. And I lost friends over this. I really did. I was amazed at how easily influenced people could be. And they had been my friends, and some of them, like I said, good students with decent grades, but it did make me very cautious about the things that I read, the things that I took in. Not that I'm impervious to being influenced, but it made me a bit cautious as I saw this silliness as I thought of it then and now, and it took hold with a lot of people. You see, we're all too easily influenced. And I mean this in two ways. We're all too easily influenced, and we're all too easily influenced. Some new thing comes along, it tickles our fancy. One of my beefs is like the Acts 29. Well, Acts ends in chapter 28. That's inspired word of God. And some new thing comes along and people fall for it and off we go. Out of body worlds unseen, mysteries unfathomable. Some new movement in society, some new movement in the church. Too easily influenced. And if you think about it with me for a moment before we dig into our text, this easily influenced aspect to our nature, we fall into things so quickly and so easily, really goes very back, goes all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis 3. Because when the serpent came to Eve, Adam and Eve really, what was he trying to do? He's trying to influence them away from being influenced by God. And what did the serpent say? Did God really say? Did God really say? Or did God really say? One good, one good translation has it, is it really true that God said? Then they who heard the word of God from the mouth of God fell under the influence of not the word of God, but the word of the serpent. Synonymous, I think, with the word of man. And since that time, the battle has been engaged, the serpent ever trying to influence mankind away from the Lord. And his most often employed weapon is just what we have here in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Is to convince people that the word of God as we have it is really just the word of men and not God. Satan even used this tactic unsuccessfully against the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Apostle Paul tells the Thessalonians that they've been brought into the kingdom. He reminds them of the power of the Word of God. And here's your insulation. Here's your protection. Here's what you need to keep yourself from being unduly influenced by those things around you and influenced away from God. The Thessalonians had been under the influence of their times, just as you and I are and have been. They had once been idolaters who believed in a variety of gods along with all the rest, just as you and I were under the influence of our surroundings. So what changes? What changed? What changes, what changed, is that they heard the Word of God for what it really is. The Word of God. I'm going to say that expression over and over because Paul does. You heard the Word of God for what it really is. The Word of God. That's what it actually is. And this is what changed. And this is what stopped that influence from rushing in on them and brought them under a new influence of God and the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ. They received it from the lips of men. That was Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. But they accepted it as not from them, but from God. The word of God at work in them. By the word of God, they've been brought to faith in Jesus Christ. And by that same powerfully working word, they were sustained in the faith as they awaited Christ. 
no different for us 2,000 years later, that you were brought to faith by the word of God and you're sustained in that faith as we await Christ's return by the power of that very word that converted you. Now in verse 12, which I read a moment ago, Paul tells us to walk in a manner worthy of God. So how is this possible? How can you walk in a manner worthy of God? With all the influence around us driving us off of course? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. By the word of God that is work in work, at work in you. In verse 14, just after our verse, Paul commends them for imitating the church in Jerusalem. That is, by being influenced by a positive example. How did they do that? Verse 13. Because they were influenced by the word of God at work in them. And in you who believe. This powerful, working, insulating word that will influence you towards walking in a manner worthy of the gospel and insulate from the wrongful influences of this world. Do you find yourself easily influenced? Do you find yourself giving in to fads like the teachings of Don Juan back in the 70s when I was a kid? We all must check ourselves to make sure that our guiding light is the influence of God's Word, which is at work in you. The powerful Word of God will influence you in everything as long as you accept it as from God. We need to remember that it is the Word of God. We need to be thankful that you've been enabled to recognize it as from God. We give thanks constantly for this, he says, that you can recognize this Word of God as the Word of God. And being thankful is a great insulator against the influences of the world. You need to recognize it as the Word of God transmitted by means of men. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this. But this is what Paul says. You heard it not as the Word of men, meaning himself, the inspired apostle. You didn't hear it as from me, he says. You heard it as what it really is, the Word of God. And we need to recognize that the Word of God is transmitted normally and predominantly through fallen men like myself and every other faithful pastor and preacher, even this morning preaching this Word. And you need to be always under the power of God's Word. The power of God's Word that is working in you. You know, God's Word is cause for thanksgiving. And we also thank God constantly for this. Now, Paul's giving a lot of thanks to the Thessalonians. He began the letter this way, chapter 1, verse 3. He says, we give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Well, this is like that. When he looks upon these Thessalonians and how they heard his words and understood the words to be the words of God, he says this is cause for thanks, constant thanks. Paul's thanks are for the way the Thessalonians received, accepted, and were transformed by the word. We're going to get to all of that as we go through this message, what it means to receive and accept and the transformation that comes from that. But if we take the parts of our verse in order, which we are, then the first order of business is that God's word is cause for thanksgiving. And as we give thanks for knowing God through his word, this is a great protection against wrongful influences because it reminds us that this word that has saved our souls is truly the word of God that he, the God of all, made us able to recognize as what it really is. I want to give one shameless plug for Sunday school. Next Sunday we're going to start in Sunday school a series on Paul's theology of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a much more prevalent theme than often we think, and it has, should have great effect on our lives. And one of the effects on our lives is right here. That as we give thanks to God, as we live lives of thanksgiving to God, as we remember that if I believe in God and I believe this Word of God is the Word of God, well, that's a grace that God showered down upon me, and I need to give thanks for it. And as we give thanks for it, we keep our focus on him. Why give thanks? Because we worship a God who communicates. He speaks. In days of old, he spoke to and through the prophets and apostles who both spoke and wrote what he said. When you think about it for a moment, God, who is sovereign Lord of all he created, which is everything, 
He speaks to man who he created. And he speaks in words that can be understood. Common words. Words that are in use by people in the times in which, in which God spoke or speaks. Common, understandable words in our own languages, in our Bibles. We worship a God who communicates. And that's worthy of thanks constantly. Jesus, who's the very Word of God, He spoke plainly and clearly and openly. He, who's God in the flesh, in the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, meaning He always was God, always will be God, cannot be other than God. And later on in that same opening of that Gospel of John, He says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Is this not cause for constant thanksgiving and keeping ourselves influenced by this God who communicates and by sending His Son? His Son communicated to us what God is, who God is, what God is all about. God in the flesh communicated the nature of God in simple language. Now the words that are spoken from the Bible are easy enough to understand. If we just take the words, we understand the definitions. If you go through your Bible, you're going to find the hardest thing to understand and pronounce is what? The names and chronicles and the genealogies. But the words themselves are not that hard to figure out. And if you compare our Bible, and especially the words of Jesus Christ, to, for example, the Puritans, who we have so much respect for, those Puritans don't know what a period is. It's all hyphen. It's all semicolon. It's all... <laughs> These sentences are pages long. I have to go back and read them four times myself, but when you read Jesus' words, well, he's pretty plain spoken, is he not? It's just right there. It's short sentences. It gets right to the point. It's in words that were understood then. It translated nicely from the original Greek into our English. Simple, understandable words. But what does he say in John chapter 8, verse 43 to the Pharisees? Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot hear my word. It is because my word is not in you. It is because you do not hear the word that I'm speaking as the word of God. Not the definitions of the words or the sentences. Their rage against him proved that they knew that pretty well. They understood the meaning behind it. And we need to, we need to understand that the unbelievers around them, those to whom we testify, be it within our family, workplace, wherever we are, generally they don't misunderstand God's Word. You know, they often, they maybe even usually understand it very, very well, like I believe the Pharisees did in Jesus' day. You speak of sin and faith and repentance. I say, well, you know, you sinned. Well, somebody who doesn't believe in God knows what you mean by sin. You did wrong. You did something wrong. They know what that means. You need to repent. They know what that means. You need to say, at the simplest, means to say you're sorry. Something like that. You need to have faith in Jesus Christ, and they know what that means. It's easy enough to understand. Why does it have no effect? Why do we testify so often to those we love, those around us who we know? And it just drops to the ground because they don't hear it as the Word of God. They fail to recognize the Word of God. You see, when a heart is changed, when God's Word is recognized as what it really is, James says the Word that is able to save your soul is a powerful Word. What's well, a miracle of grace, is it not? And that's one that should cause constant thanksgiving to God. And that constant thanksgiving to God is such a great protection against being wrongly influenced by the world around and the things that could draw us away from believing that it is His Word. Hear how the Baptist Confession puts it. The grace of faith, whereby the elect are enabled, now note the word, elect are enabled. Not you're able to do this, you're made able. You are a passive recipient, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, meaning the faith to believe is a gift. Okay? The elect are enabled, to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also and by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer and other means appointed of God, it is increased and strengthened.
How do you know God? By His Spirit opening your heart to believe that the word you hear is the very word of God. So when that, God, that word calls you to repent, you unrepentant, unconverted sinner, and you feel that within your spirit stirring you up and making you want to repent and making you want to come to Christ and making you want to go to God in sorrow for your sins. It is God's Spirit showing you that the Word being declared even from this pulpit, that you must repent and put your faith in Christ Jesus. You're beginning to hear that as the very Word of God. I ask you who are hearing me this day, has your heart been changed? Do you hear the Word of God as the Word of God in the preaching of His Word? In the teaching of His Word? In your own reading of His Word? If so, if you can say yes to that, we can say hallelujah. And I also say that this is constant cause for thanksgiving to God. Every time you hear God's Word, every time you read God's Word, every time you pray God's Word, and you know it as God's Word, you have cause to stop for just a minute and say, Thank you, Lord, that I know that this is your Word. Only God could take ordinary language and cause you to accept it as His Word. Only God could take a heart of stone, turn it into a heart of flesh, that wants to hear and know and recognize God's Word. And because it is His Word, and it is He who reveals it as such, He deserves all the thanks. Because honestly, folks, we had nothing to do with it. We study His Word. We understand His Word. We take it apart as best we can so we can apply it to our lives. But in the end, I should say in the beginning, you had nothing at all to do with it. It's a grace of God. Now, how does this protect us from the influence of the world? You know, when we are looking at a paper, and especially with the Internet, so many things are so easy to put our fingers on. I would think of QAnon, which I know very little about, except that it's very influential. People read it, and they say, wow, this makes sense. I want to go along with this, whatever this really is. What should the Christian do? You don't have, I don't say that reading these things is wrong in and of themselves within certain parameters of common sense. But what if you stop and say, thank you, Lord, that I know you by your word. I have my Bible here, and anything I read, even though I'm just interested in it, and I'm going to shrug my shoulders at the end and say, okay, that was nice. I'm glad I know that. Now I have some knowledge. I'm going to look at your word, Father, because you made me able to know this is your word. Would that not insulate you well? from undue influences, would you not then be able to read something just out of interest within reasonable parameters? I'm talking common sense here. But if you're thankful to God that you know his word, would that not help us to be unduly, from being unduly influenced? I believe it would. Being th th constantly thankful to God for your ability to recognize his word as such is a great protection from worldly influences. This Word of God comes to you through some very ordinary means, which is also a cause for thanksgiving and for wonder. God's Word through men is still God's Word. We need to spend some time here. But the Apostle Paul says he gives thanks constantly because of this, that when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, important words, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as what it really is. Emphasis mine. The Word of God. The commentator William Hendrickson, he writes here that received is external reception. In other words, you hear the Word of God being spoken to you. It goes in your ear, processes in your mind, and you understand what is being said. Simple words bringing forth a fairly simple message. An extraordinary message, really, because salvation is an extraordinary thing, that God, who is holy, would condescend to send his Son to save sinners, none of whom are even close to holy, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And here's a wonder that that message comes to you from sinners like yourself, this morning from me. Received is just understand the words. To put together the sentences and say, okay, here's the point he's making. God's word is God's word, and that's cause for thanksgiving. 
And Paul says that you receive the word of God, understanding it to be the word of God, even though it came flowing to you from the mouths of men. That's the external reception. He goes on to say, accepted is the inward welcoming. This is the transformation, the transformational power of the word of God. It's the difference between giving a hearing which I hope you're giving me. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I hope you're listening and giving me a hearing this morning. But it's the difference between a hearing and accepting in your person what is meant by what you received. Edmund Hybert adds that acceptance implies a favorable evaluation of what was accepted. And brethren, you can't have a favorably accepted God's word, given a favorable evaluation, excuse me, of God's word, but 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 that God has changed your heart. Because God's word is not easy to hear. It says you're a sinner. It says you're born in iniquity. You're woven together in sin. There's nothing good in you. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. Your condemnation is deserved. You deserve nothing but to die forever and ever with the worms eating at you and so forth. Are those easy to hear? No, but all glory to God. When I tell you this, if you will repent, you have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have peace with God. How are the Thessalonians insulated from outside influences that conspired to draw them back to their old ways? What keeps us from falling back into our old ways? Those old influences. It's the same way for us as it was for them by having accepted God's Word as the Word of God. And what is God's word that is giving this protection? You received the word of God. You heard it, what you heard from us. You accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. What does that mean? That means in our immediate context this morning, for example, that the preached word, the taught word, the read word when you're reading yourselves and in your home, is received as his word. Now ask ourselves for a moment, what did the Thessalonians hear? He says, you heard not as the word of men, but the word of God. But what did they hear? I mean, did Paul go into the market and unroll the scroll and start reading directly from the scriptures? No, his pattern was to find a likely place to gain an audience and to engage people with common or everyday words that explain the gospel of our extraordinary and remarkable Lord Jesus So what's the wonder of grace here? What's the cause of thanksgiving? They heard what Paul said as what God said. Now we're not talking directly here, 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is inspired by God or breathed out by God, which it is. And Paul's the one who wrote that. But we're in a kind of a more common, ordinary level here. That Paul is probably in a marketplace and simply found a crowd of people and found an entrance to begin to speak in speaking to them about this. They heard these common words from the apostle as the word of God. Paul not elevating himself beyond what was proper. You know, when the people of Lystra offered him and Barnabas sacrifices, he was appalled. He stopped it right away. But that said, the word of God in the context of 1 Thessalonians 2.13 has a more expansive context than we might often think. The great Puritan Matthew Henry writes about the Word of God through the lips of men this way. And I have to tell you, when I find myself lined up with the great Puritans, I'm pretty sure I'm on a right track. Not perfectly, because they're sinners like us. But it gives me some confidence. But listen to what he says here. He says, however, it is in truth the Word of God. And what does he mean there? It is in truth. He's talking about the truth being preached to you. It is in truth the Word of God. Such was the word the apostles preached by divine inspiration, and such is that which is left upon record, written in the scriptures by divine inspiration, and such is that word which in our days is preached, being either contained or evidently founded on or deduced from these sacred oracles. Do you understand what we're saying? They heard Paul speaking to them in conversations, if you will. And yet what he was saying they heard is the word of God because it was stirring their souls. That powerful word of God changing them and making them understand that it was indeed that word of God which was saving them. 
Dr. Hybert writes in the same vein, the word of God here is not the written word, but the oral preaching of the gospel under the power of the Spirit. God's messenger must rely on the Bible. We understand there's no word of God beyond this Bible. This is his word. We have it here. There's no innovation. There's nothing new. No man gets new scripture or new revelation. Zero. None. I want to make that very clear. But every loyal preacher or teacher is a channel of, quote, the word of God. Most of us were converted by the word of God spoken through human lips. Now for me, the most influential people in my journey to Christ were my wife and my friend Mike Kelly. They told me something like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's a quote from John chapter 3, verse 16. Now what does that mean, I ask? Well, it means that you must repent of your sin. It means that you need to put your trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. It means that in Jesus alone can you be saved from God's eternal wrath. Hey, Josh, what this means is that God, who is love, gave his son, and if you'll believe in him, he gave his son to you. So in the meaning of 1 Thessalonians 2.13, which part of that is the word of God? Well, the quote from John 3.16 obviously is the word of God, but the explanation, as it is true to John 3.16, is in this context, the word of God. In Paul's meaning in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, that's the word of, word of God. The true and accurate explanation is the word. Not new revelation, nothing innovative, not some fancy way of attacking the Bible. No. The orthodox faith as we have it, standing on the shoulders of great men as centuries of church history, as it is explained accurately in language that can be understood, as is true to the scriptures. That's all the word of God. This sermon, so far as it accurately brings the word of God that we have in scriptures, is the word of God in the broad sense we're speaking of here. The Thessalonians were able, by God's grace, to discern this. They heard God's word is just that, whether quoted directly to them or explained to them. Now, if God dropped down here in some form and says, thus says me, well, we'd know that was the word of God. God doesn't do that. He speaks to you through the lips of men, in our context, through me and through Pastor Owens. You can't leave here thinking that you've heard my ideas or my agenda, thinking that you've heard only the word of man. It's a very dangerous thing to hear the gospel and say, well, that's just Pastor Josh's idea. That's what he thinks. No, this is what the Scripture thinks. You know, I follow McShane's Bible reading for my daily reading. I recently went through Exodus 14. This is when Egypt is chasing after Israel. This is when the Red Sea parts, Israel on dry land, and the chariots of Egypt catching up to them because they're chariots, and the Israelites are on foot. Well, as they're chasing them, do you remember what God does? He, he, he drives their wheels into the mud so they can't keep up with the Israelites. And the Egyptians say this, I quote, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them against us. That's the word of God. They say, you know, hey, fellow Egyptian in that chariot, are you having a hard time getting ahead? Yeah, I am. What's your problem? The, the Lord is fighting against us. Well, they knew the word of God. They heard the warning of impending death. What did they do? They ignored it. They didn't hear the word of God as the word of God. They chased after the Israelites. They refused to turn around. The Israelites get on the other side. The waters crash in. They all drown. Well, you too are warned. You too are warned about hearing the word of God as the word of God. The word of God is, and I quote, God now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That's the word of God. But hear the word of God. He has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by a man. That man is Jesus Christ. Now the scripture doesn't say Jesus Christ. The scripture says a man. But I just told you it's Jesus Christ. That's the word of God. 
And he's appointed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by his righteous servant, Jesus. He raised him from the dead. And that gives you assurance that Jesus' sacrifice was full and sufficient and adequate to bring you to God. He raised him from the dead. And he will raise you from the dead now, if you put your faith in him. And he will raise you from the dead later. When you will join Jesus in a resurrection like his, he being the first fruits, and we follow in his way. Do you believe this? Did you hear the word of God? Either as I quoted it, or as I explained it to you as best I am able? Is the answer no? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, the word of God puts its finger on the problem. For good news came to us as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith to those who listened. It takes faith. You must put your faith in Jesus Christ. You must put your faith in this word of Jesus Christ that is coming to you and repent of your sin. Otherwise, it will not benefit you. You will hear it and you'll think, that's his idea. He seems like a clever speaker, if I'm a clever speaker at all. Those are kind of nice words. Seems sort of a waste of time on Sunday, but it was kind of fun. I hope there's some food afterwards. That sort of crass thinking. You're not hearing it as the Word of God. A very dangerous, eternally dangerous and consequential way to think. Never lose your wonder, you who believe. Never lose your wonder that the Word of the God of the universe finds its way to you through mortal men, men with feet of clay. As when Moses was made as God to Pharaoh, as when Elijah prayed to begin and end a drought, or when Paul shut Elimus' eyes, you or I will never do those particular deeds, but the word of God that empowered them is the same as we have today, just as the Holy Spirit who empowers us through that word is the same Holy Spirit who was then. You're hearing the word of God this morning, quoted and explained. It's all the word of God, and it's a powerful word. It's a powerful word that by that power can keep you from being influenced wrongly. What does Paul say? Which is at work in you believers? That word for which he gives thanks is at work in you believers. Paul writes of a God that has a, con a word of God, excuse me, that has constant effect in you who believe. The word at work is what we call a present active and middle voice verb. It works presently and continuously in you. It's here in the here and now. Its agency in you is active. It's an active word. It does something. It converts you. It exhorts you. It rebukes you. It encourages you. It counsels you. It's a powerful word. It does something. And it's a middle-voiced verb. Now, I'm not going to give a long lecture on what the middle voice in Greek is, except to say this, by middle is meant that the subject of the verb, you believers, act upon themselves, you act upon yourself for your own benefit. It's at work in you believers. It's the power of God and His Word within you, a power of God that you are working to your own benefit. As you hear the preaching, as you study God's Word, as you pray, all those means of grace God has given us it means that you act upon yourself by receiving the benefits of God's Word. This powerful Word that will keep you insulated from all the influences that come in. This Word that, as I said, if you could stop and thank God before you read whatever it is going to be read that might influence you the wrong way, you say, thank you, God, that I have your Word. This powerful Word that is working even now within you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, well known to many of us. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Here's a verse, if you recognize that as the word of God, did you hear the word of God when I read that? As the word of God? Boy, before we do that click, before we allow ourselves to even see something that might influence us wrongly, what if we read that? As the word of God to ourselves. What if we read that? 
Would that powerful word not give us some protection and keep us on the right path? I believe it would. The Word of God works in you who believe. It worked in you when you were caused to believe, and it works in you now. It's a powerful Word to guard and protect you from all the wrongful influences in the world out there. One of the greatest influences, one of the greatest weapons used against you is this idea of God's Word and the sanctity of it and the truth of it. As I said, that's what the devil used against Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 3. That's what he tried to use against the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4. And that's what he uses against us now. Prowling about, seeing whom he may devour. Remember that this word is powerful within you. And it's a true word. You know, the world has so many explanations for the Bible. In today's society where same-sex marriage has become legal and is being celebrated... You know, there's many who look at the Bible, and these are very smart people, educated at a very high level, hard people to debate with because they're so quick. But they look at the Bible and say, well, you know what it means in Romans chapter 1 where he speaks of sinning against nature? Well, if God made you in this particular way, homosexual or whatever it is, and you don't live that way, well, that's a sin against nature. And you look at that, and you could do this. What? Where did that come from? Now, that's a very simple one. There are many other twists that people give to Scripture and strangle its real meaning out of it. And we can fall for it. We must protect ourselves from, being, from falling for it. Well, God protects us. But remember that middle voice. We protect ourselves by remembering that the Word of God in us is powerful and working within us. It's always, always, always to begin that influence away from God by showing you that the Word of God is something God didn't really say. Paul gave constant thanks that the Thessalonians heard the Word of God he preached as not his but God's Word. A life of thanksgiving is a great safeguard against intrusions by worldly influences as is a life of acting upon yourself by receiving for yourself the steady working power of God's Word. And this is so important because of how powerful men's words can be. Not powerful like God's Word, but we have to admit there's some power to them. They say the pen is mightier than the sword. The pen wrote the Magna Carta. One of the most influential, influential, and people would say positive, influential documents ever written, limiting the king's power, giving recognition of some basic human rights. Maybe we could even call them natural rights. And that written word is among the most influential in a positive way ever written and led almost directly to our Declaration of Independence. Also positive, also extremely influential and history changing. That's a good influence, is it not? An unknown monk on October 31st, 1577 posted 95 theses on the door at the church at Wittenberg. We know that Martin Luther in the beginning of the Reformation. We would call that positive, the power of the pen. We need to be careful, though, because the pen is powerful. I named those two. Those are eight positive influences. I have heads nodding. Yes, those are good. Some centuries after Martin Luther... Another thing written by men was very powerful and influenced an entire nation. I speak of Mein Kampf and its vision of racial superiority and its vision of constant conspiracies against that one particular nation, this nationalistic vision. It was very powerful. And it influenced and swayed an entire nation. It brought the world into a war such as we never saw before. God willing, we will never see again. And it brought almost complete disaster and destruction upon that nation. We need to be careful when we're looking at man's words, even if they call themselves Christian. You look at Martin Luther's 95 Theses. When I say that, we have heads nodding. Yes, that's good. Read them. Read them carefully. Read them circumspectly. If they match God's word, as God willing, what I'm saying matches God's word, let it influence you. Be careful. Be circumspect. We're easily influenced. 
And men's words can be more powerful than we really imagine. We're too easily influenced to not be very cautious. When Paul came to Athens, he came to a place where the Scripture says, now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except hearing or telling something new. They wanted to be influenced, as I'm afraid too many of us are. We need to recognize what we hear, what we read, what we say for what it really is. I may be oversimplifying the matter, but in the end, there's only two sources of influence. There's man and God. Men can speak for God, and as far as they accurately, accurately depict God, they speak for Him. In this case, their basis, what has influenced them to speak or write, and so the one for whom they want to have influence is God. So we hear the Word of God. Let us be insulated from the undue influence of the world around us. Paul would have the Thessalonians prepare themselves for the persecutions to come. And this is the first bulwark he gives them, that they were to remind them they heard the word of God for what it really is, as the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. He reminds them, I remind you. Live your life in a thankful mood, thanking God always that he has opened your eyes and your heart to believe that the word of God is really his word. Live a life under the preaching of God's word. Be discerning. Hear my words. And as I tell you what God's word means, you're hearing the word of God in that broadest sense. Be under the preaching of God's word. Let God's word be the influence. And remember that this isn't just words that God gave us. They're words attended by the power of his spirit. It's a living and powerful and active word that is at work in you who believe. This is what the Apostle Paul reminds the Thessalonians of, how they had come under that influence, not of men but of God. And this is what I remind you of, you who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have come under the influence of His Word, the very Word of God. And may it be so as we walk on the ways and go along the byways, may we remember that this Word that God has given you is cause for constant thanksgiving. It's a powerful word working in you even now. Amen? Grace, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together once again. Thank you for the day that we have and for the word that you've given us. And I thank you most of all this morning, Father, that our eyes have been opened, that our hearts have been melted to know that the word that we hear, the word that we read in the scriptures, the word that we proclaim to each other as we speak of Jesus Christ is the word of God that will sustain us through this journey in this world and keep us from being influenced away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you for this. And I pray you watch over us in Jesus' name. Amen.